Hi, Green Women. I'm here with my some of my favorite people, Dave and Elaine. And I asked them to um, talk with me a little bit today about just a couple things that we're always talking about, which is trauma and then climate change and climate crisis. And um, I know you're all thinking about it like we're thinking about it. And um, I don't know, Dave and I have been talking a lot about, you know, the virus taking overshadowing the emphasis on the climate crisis issue. And um, I don't know, thoughts? We're just going to have a conversation. That's, yeah. um, I loved what you said about the article. Dave read an article um, that he told me about. I haven't read it yet. About Well, I mean, one of the things I read a few weeks ago is um, it would be nice if we as a planet as a as a species could respond to the climate crisis the way we're responding to COVID-19 because it's going to require that and probably even a bigger response a um, you know a, a more systemic response we need to get down to the core of the way we operate on this planet if we're really going to address climate change yeah yeah mm. Well, I've been thinking about um, the impact on our bodies. Uh, again, that mind, body, spirit connection, but the impact on our bodies with the um, virus, as well as the constant um, information and the political system and the resistance like climate change to look at the reality of this mm -hmm. um, and you know that whole sense of denial 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 and hearing it over and over again um, or even if you stop listening to the news, um, you know, and make sure that you are not bombarded. Even that initial hearing it, let's say it would be once, once a day or something, it still hits your nervous system. Sure. Right. Sure. You know, so um, I was thinking um, in preparation or just thinking about this through the, through um, this time of the original quote that I had in October with um, the lawyer from the Southern District of New York, um, Preet, and um, let's see, I've got it here. But he says, you know, investigations are hard. We underestimate the difficulty complexity and length and I thought yeah you know I was thinking back to that because you know trying to come up with a vaccine mm -hmm. um, you know trying to look at the complexity of the virus and as we all have experienced the length of you know staying home and um, shutting down you know systems you know the parallel is that's what happens with trauma mm -hmm. you know is um the investigation is hard um and i i think one of the things we fall into as i see it with the investigation of the virus you know, is to only get so far and then you think, I got it, or we have it, or this is it. And then, like he talks about, then you have the length of it. Mm -hmm. And then something else, you know, happens, you know. So in this case, the virus, you know, can trigger whatever it is inside of yourself and there you are in another journey. And I think sometimes then we fight with ourselves and saying, well, I did the work, you know, and here I am back again. 
-hmm. And it's not always a cognitive thing. You know, it's like, I think that with the bombardment of the information with our lives and the information and the reality of our lives, then the nervous system takes it on. Mm -hmm. And we go back to fight, flight, you know, freeze or mm -hmm. fawn. Mm -hmm. And then we're back at it again. But the body's gonna tell you because the muscle structure is so complex that for some person it might be a headache. And you know, then you were working on your back pain and now it's back, literally. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, you thought you had your anxiety in control and now it's back. You know, so the length of trauma work is long, it's never ending. And I think a myth is that it does end. You know, once you recognize it and, and do the initial work. And I think with the virus too, it's like, uh, you know, it does, it's not ending. And, you know, in this case, we can have a test, you know, but we're not getting the test. But how do you test that longevity of uh, trauma? You know, I've just been thinking about the investigation, the complexity very much, and then the length of it. That kind of parallels, you know, two very hard topics to talk about in climate change, you know, environmental injustice and trauma. And I think with them, um with the COVID-19, there's this, at least what I'm observing, there's this real desire to say, okay, we've investigated it, we know it, now let's get on with things. You know, let's get back to normal. Yeah. You know, that's a whole topic in itself because normal is, I don't want to go back to normal. Normal is full of greed and injustice and, and so many things that we need to, you know, I mean, in a sense, we have this opportunity now to um, sort of, I can use the analogy, pushing the reset button. You know, this is, we've all now are taking a step back. And I just read this interesting article that various nations in Europe are looking at um, kind of taking, kind of post COVID-19, getting their systems based on what they call the, the European Green Deal. And that is really setting things up so we do not have several more decades of reliance on fossil fuels. And I'm, I'm kind of amazed that wow. nations of the world are actually thinking this. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that um, you can kind of take that same concept and apply it to ourselves. Because each of us now has this opportunity to kind of push the reset button on ourselves because we are doing things differently. And when we have the opportunity to be out of our homes and start socializing and going back to work or whatever the things we do, we don't have to do it the same as we did before. We change the way we consume. We are, we've already changed the way we consume now. The way we consume time, the way we consume money, the way we consume media. And we can, we can kind of be more deliberate and, and look at how we're going to go forward differently if we choose to. I just read this fascinating article by Mikhail Gorbachev in Time Magazine, where he says that, and he says the same thing. He said, we as a world need to now start over. And the start over is, I, I was amazed that he said this. He says, we need to make a commitment. He needs, we need to convene the UN or something, and we need to, move forward with a 10 to 15% reduction right off the bat. And so it, it's fascinating to see some people, not our president, but some people really wanting to take this as an opportunity to change the way we move forward. And again, I think that could be applied to how we live our own personal lives. Right, right. Well, and I think, you know, again, with the reality of um, what we know about neuroscience and trauma, 
it's a question that right here, right now in your body, being able to identify past um, healing modalities, you know, that worked, um, but, but with the reality of the intensity of environmental injustice, climate warming, and um, the development of, um, you know, 30 years of trauma work, it can be a reset button too, you mm -hmm. know, for our bodies. Um, are we still listening to our bodies or are our heads controlling this? You know, again, the right answer, the old normal, I used to do that, it worked for me then, you know. So it's changing that script, you know, when you have the anxiety, you know, because of external information, which is just being bombarded on us. The reality of somebody maybe in your family, of yourself, you know, getting the virus, um, you know, that is increased. Of course, it's going to increase. But depending on your personal physiology and how it hits your body, you could do a reset too you know, on some of the things that we talked about, other than, you know, the deeper, the deeper sense of that, when the trigger is there, um, you know, and not merely just exercise or, um, you know, what worked for you before. So I think it really is a deepening and also a not so happy reminder that, trauma doesn't go away you know it is held in our cells in in our muscles but we walk through it you know like we so, you know like we have 20 years ago like we did you know uh, earlier than that or like maybe recently you've just discovered you know that developmental trauma has really impacted your life so it doesn't go away and the virus isn't going away, you know, and pushing up the economy, you know, and just getting back out there is the old answer. Right. Right. You know, so I think there's some old answers that we also have, um, that it's going to take that reflection time to say, how can I do it in, in a new way? Or the harder thing is if you haven't done it and your anxiety is really high or your migraines have returned, you know, you know, something more intense that your body, the physiology of your body is saying, I still need to work on this. You know, I need another way. And it could be that top-down work, or it could be the bottom-up work, as we all know. Um, but there's a lot of parallels with, with the, mm -hmm. you know, the virus, and also because it, you know, you can't see it. Uh -huh. So it really, um, I think, challenges a belief system. Um, the belief system, again, you know, seeing is believing. <laughs> yeah, you can't see climate change. You can see the impacts of it. But you exactly. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't see trauma. I mean, you know, you can't take this test, but, you know, it is there. Um, you know, and we, we see the effects of that, you know, in our bodies. Um, but the other piece, and I just touched on it, and I, I hadn't thought about it, is, you know, when we reset, are we resetting those belief systems? Can we even see that we're in them? Mm. You know, like dualism. Um, right. And uh, all or nothing thinking. Um, 
you know, that those really get us stuck. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been seeing a, a few posts, more than a few, of people saying things like, oh, you know, our air quality is so clear now. Climate change is really going away. And Mother Earth is just healing herself. And um, what, what would you say? Like, because it, it links well, in. Well, yeah, I know, yeah. but I mean, millions of people are not working and they don't have money to pay the rent and they don't have money to buy food. And so, I mean, it just goes to show that we need to re retool our entire way of living, living, you Because once we go back to that, it's going to come right back. all the emissions are back and the smog will be back. And sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just, I think it's a uh, parochial or two elemental to think, Oh, now everything got fixed. Yeah. Right. And the same thing with trauma, like I said before, you know, I, I had it. I think I had it. I got it. You know, I've been working, blah, 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 blah. But then, you know, it, it hasn't gone away. It won't go away, you know, and you have to shift. You just have to make a major reset you know, for who you are now, for the circumstances that are going on right now, and for ways, top down, bottom up, that right here, right now, you can change and make a difference. Mm -hmm. and, and doing that while we are being re-traumatized. Yes. I mean, that, I mean we, have, we have our own personal traumas from our past, but you can't, I can't listen to the news and not feel like I'm being traumatized by the injustice, mm -hmm. by the insanity, mm -hmm. by, um, by so many things. It's, it's right. really hard. I, I read this very interesting article. It was called Enduring the Unendurable. And kind of the essence of it was we here in, in the West, in the United States, and in many Western countries, we have really been insulated from what it's like to live with the uncertainty of living in a war zone. And this, this um, journalist spent a lot of time interviewing people living in Afghanistan. And, you know, they've been dealing with war and the uncertainty that war brings for a long time. And one of the things they realized, she, you know, she realizes these people, when bad things are happening, as it's happening, they have accepted the fact that they have to get through it and whether it's bombs dropping or people being killed or whatever. And then they have stretches of time where that's not actually happening. And these people have this ability to be okay, to, to, to kind of get on with their life, knowing that they can't really make plans because any plans that they make could be thwarted by the next bomb, the next you know terrorist attack, whatever. And in a sense, we now, are in that. It's not the same, you know, it, it's not bombs falling, but it's all of this uncertainty that accompanies this virus. We don't know what's ahead. And that's new for us. You know, we are in control. We know how to, you know, we plan, I'm buying plane tickets to go somewhere next fall and all of that. That's, at least for the immediate future, that is no longer our reality. And, um, there are lessons to be learned from these people who live in these war-torn areas that still manage to get up and, and be okay when it's okay. Right, right. Yeah. No, well, I, I think yeah. part of that in terms of when I was talking about a belief system and listening to you, Dave, is, you know, uh, a, a, another way of thinking that, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't help with this sense of resilience is compartmentalization. Mm. You know, so if we can compartmentalize and keep every compartment not touching the other compartment in our brains, you know, we're good. Good luck. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, we're, we're good at it. And actually, sometimes that is very helpful because you do not want to think about the trauma. That is the way we numb ourselves. But on the other hand, just like 
with environmental work, if you do not believe, really believe the concept that, you know, we hear it every day, every day that we're all connected, you know, but fundamentally believe that, then you know one action, you know, impacts another action. But if you can compartmentalize that, you know, which is control, you know, then this reality we're going through is, is hard. I mean, more than hard. It is challenging to a belief system like that. And that is pretty much normal for Western culture. Right. And it is praised. Um, it is so um, um, accepted and we've internalized it that we don't even know. And that's the challenge that happens when finally the body, you know, right, right here in this situation, you know, in whatever way, you know, because of, because of our nervous system and the muscular system, you know, is going to start screaming. Uh -huh. And basically what it's saying is we're all connected. I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. you know so not having food not having the money for rent you know not having a job you know that is going to um, arouse the amygdala it's going to go into fight fight flee or fawn mm -hmm. and all of us have a preference for that mm -hmm. you know so it I think that it's really, um, I think and I feel that it's uh, really that reset, but there's got to be an awareness and some uh, knowing that um, our brains are really working hard now. Uh, and, you know, like you say, just challenging, challenging what is to try to not just solve what can be, but to really make it different. Mm -hmm. And I think it's true with trauma from what I can see with people and know, you know, with, with my small narrow world, um, yeah. saying I'm doing trauma work today definitely means something different than it did 20, 20 years ago. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, speaking, of going back um, twenty years. If we go back fifty years, that was the very first Earth Day, uh -huh. and we're coming upon the fifty-year anniversary. Uh -huh. And I came upon this National Geographic, and it's all about. Let's look. I will. Okay. Let's look fifty years further to twenty seventy, because we've now had fifty years of celebrating Earth Day, year after year after year. And this National Geographic is great because one side is the optimist view of what it's going to be like in 2070. And the other side is the pessimist view of what if it's going to be like in 2070. And, you know, when I, when I get National Geographic, I usually don't read a cover to cover. I did read this cover to cover. Of course, I had to turn it upside down. And I read the optimist first, and then I read the pessimist. And I'd be really curious if you could all get a hold of this, and let's have a discussion on it. Where do you find yourself landing? Um, I'm not going to share where I landed. Um, it, was, it was really eye-opening um, to, to observe the way I was responding to the optimist and the pessimist, and, and um, lots of articles, you know, things written by people I've read before, various authors, and um, it'd be great to have a discussion on this, or at least um, get this, read, read some of it and journal about it because um, it really is, 2070 is coming. I mean, I'm probably not going to be here for it, but my kids are. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Well, and I think too, again, that's a, a visual, but also the reality of, um, you know, the opposite, you know, positive, negative, again, dualism and in the complexity of trauma, it is not one or the other. 
you know, it is a mix and it's really mixed up. Mm -hmm. And so you probably don't land on one or the other, you know, unless you have that mindset, strong mindset for one or the other. But I would, I would venture to say in trauma work, it's a real mixture when you move from right or wrong, good or bad, positive or negative, to a more pluralistic way of thinking. That's the complexity, and it's not easy to think that way. And I would, I would say that the, the majority of us do not want to think that way, because it really is hard. You know, to figure out that complexity, that it didn't look like it, you know, the trauma 20 years ago, but I still have it, mm -hmm. you know, so um, I don't know. I just think it permeates so much that 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 um, not push to the critical thinking part. Mm -hmm. It's painful. You know, not only do you have pain, physical pain with trauma your body's speaking to you but you know the pain of having to really really think and move out of these that is a structure just as old as some of our institutional structures that are falling down mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. yeah in this article i read about um working with the people in afghanistan one of the things that the people that live there accept is that suffering is just a part of being alive and isn't that a Buddhist teaching yeah is once you can accept yes. that suffering just comes with being alive you're not fighting you're not fighting the suffering you're actually accepting it and by accepting it then you can actually deal with it oh well yeah because another truth in buddhism is to accept to accept what is Except what is, right? Yes. You know, and suffering is, but again, in compartmental thinking, you have suffering and no suffering. Right, right. And you're constantly like, no, 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 I'm not going to suffer here. Good or bad. Yeah. Uh, I am not going to suffer. I'm actually seeing that with the political conversation. You know, it's either Bernie or Trump. You know, it's black or white, and there's a lot of room in between there. Mm -hmm. But the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and, we're, and we're just about out of time. Okay. So thank you to Elaine and to Dave for being here today. Um, if you um, watched our video today, um, this was designed to be a conversation for the Green Women Leadership Project. However, this video may find its way to you. And if you're interested in the topics of green leadership in, in the interested in the topic of the climate crisis and trauma, then we hope you got something really valuable out of this today. So thank you so much for coming and um, we'll probably have another talk and we'll invite you to come back. Thanks. Okay. Do I have enough time to read a poem? Yes. Do. Yes, right, of right, course, right. I'm yes. sorry. Okay, that's all right. No. Um, Oh, we now, have a poem by David White when we did the training, and I had another poem here that I thought, you know, applied. Um, it's called Sometimes. Um, sometimes, if you move carefully through the forest, breathing like the ones in the old stories, who could cross a shimmering bed of leaves without a sound, you come to a place whose only task is to trouble you with tiny but frightening requests. Conceived out of nowhere, but in this place, beginning to lead everywhere. Request to stop what you're doing right now and to stop what you are becoming while you do it. Questions can make or unmake a life. Questions have patiently waited for you. Questions that have no right to go away. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. Thank you.